brother. <laughs> If you have God's Word, if you would turn back with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3. As I mentioned last week, we uh, started the sermon, and if you notice, I preached for about 40 minutes or so, somewhere around there. And uh, had I preached the whole message, we'd have been here for another 30 or 40 minutes, and I'm sure y'all didn't really want to do that. I would have been fine with that, but I'm sure most of y'all didn't want to do that, so... We were talking about last week, uh, the last days, and that's what this chapter talks about. So let's read together what Paul had to say. Let's read this whole chapter together, and I wanna, we're going to kind of talk about the second half of it since we talked about the first half of it last week. But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Avoid such people. For among them are those who creep into household and capture weak women burdened with sins and led astray by various passions. Always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses... So these men also oppose the truth. Men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith. But they will not get very far, for their folly will be plain to all, as was that of those two men. You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, which persecutions I endured, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil people and impostors will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it. And how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. Great, great chapter of God's Word. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we do come with hearts and ears attentive to what you need to say to us today. Lord, we do live in perilous times. Lord, there's persecutions that are increasing every day. And the world's getting worse. It's not getting better. Lord, according to this word, this word from uh, your scripture, Lord, it'll get worse, not better, before Jesus comes back. Lord, help us to be faithful to the task you've given to us. And Lord, we pray that. and We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. As I introduced the sermon last week, I quoted from a letter that John Adams wrote to Thomas Jefferson. He said, you and I have lived in serious times. You think about the Revolutionary War when this nation was being formed. It was pretty precarious. Most of those guys uh, spent their whole lives and their fortunes to, to make this country uh, a possibility. And it was difficult days. But as the Bible says here, 
as we approach the last days, we're going to live in perilous times. It's not going to get any better. And I don't know about you guys, but I want my life to count. I want to, uh, to make a difference. You know, God didn't put me here just to take up space and to breathe air. You know, He put me here so that I might serve Him, so that I might honor Him. And so that people, through my witness, through what God is doing in my life, can come to know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. And every believer has been put here for that same purpose. Last week we talked about if you and I are going to make a difference in the world in which we find ourselves, that there's some things that we must understand and that we must hold on to. And the first thing that we talked about last week that we must understand is the context in which we live. And as we read through and we studied last week all of those different things that, that Paul mentions here in this passage of Scripture, and we saw how every one of those things have an example. And most of you, I guarantee you, can give an example of every one of these things. People are ungrateful. They're unholy. Kids are disobedient to their parents. Just go down the list. It's like a checklist of what we see happening in our world today. Now, I'm not saying that Jesus Christ is coming back tomorrow. He could, couldn't he? Pro prophecy has been fulfilled for the most part. He could come back any day now. But the longer he tarries, the worse the situation is going to be. It's going to get worse. And you and I might as well be prepared for it. One way we can be prepared for it is by studying God's Word. So if you and I are going to make a difference, first of all, we have to understand the context in which we live. Nextly, next, we need to understand our commitment to Jesus Christ. Our commitment to Jesus Christ. Paul says talks about those guys that, uh, really those false prophets, those false teaching who were disqualified from the faith. They acted like they were believers in Christ, but they weren't. And they were leading astray God's people. Timothy, who was the pastor, and this, this will happen in Ephesus. He's writing to Timothy. This letter is really written to the pastor of that church. Timothy, the young man, Paul's protege, and Paul is telling Timothy, look, Timothy, these guys are coming in here. Don't have anything to do with these guys because they're mixing up and messing up and confusing God's people. And then he says in verse 10, but you, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim, my life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings. In other words, Timothy, you know how you ought to live. You need to understand your commitment to Jesus Christ. You have committed your life to faith and to patience and to love and to steadfastness. And you understand from what you've experienced with me the persecution that Christians have to face. Timothy, you understand these things. And you and I as believers, we need to understand our commitment to Jesus Christ. We have good godly examples, don't we? For some of it, it was, was our parents. Some of it, it was a, a, a pa godly pastor that we grew up under. I, I still remember there was a great, I had a great mentor in uh, my early years when I was in high school from a youth music slash youth slash music director. Uh, and he took me under his wings and I went and did hospital visits with him. I spent almost all summer with him, hanging out with him. We played guitars together. He kind of taught me a little bit about playing the guitar and uh, we went to hospitals together. He taught me how to run sound equipment together. But more importantly, he just invested life in me, invested time in me. And he showed me what it meant to be a godly person in Christ Jesus. And that's what Paul is saying to Timothy. We need to understand as we follow the teaching and examples of godly individuals, our lives will be pleasing to God. But let me say this on the other hand, when you and I live lives that are pleasing to God, guess what? It's not going to please man. Paul says, Timothy, you know the persecutions. In fact, we're, the places that he mentioned, Iconium and Lystra, we talked about those last week and this week in our Sunday school lesson. If you've been here, if you've been studying your Sunday school lesson. And Paul was stoned and left dead in Lystra. Thought, thought, they thought he was dead. And uh, God miraculously uh, restored his health. And so... Uh, if you and I seek to live a godly life in an ungodly world, why would we not think we would be persecuted? You see, our commitment is to follow Jesus Christ, whatever the cause. 
Paul says here, all who desire to live godly lives in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Is that not what Jesus Christ said himself? He said, if they persecuted me, guess what? They're going to persecute you. Here's the truth. Evil people have always existed. Those evil people do the bidding of their father, Satan. And they try as much as possible to distract us. They try as much as possible to get us to turn away from Christ, to live the kind of lifestyle they live. Y'all ever notice that? Ungodly people want you to live like them. And if you mess up just one time, what do they do? So you're not any different than I am. Don't they do that? Don't they point fingers at you? The difference, of course, is you and I have been born again, and our Heavenly Father takes us out to the shed, woodshed sometimes, and has to get our attention. But I want you to know lost people are looking at you. And at times they're going to persecute you. At times they're going to make fun of you. At times they're not going to understand why you're doing what you're doing. But guys, our commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ is that Jesus Christ is Lord of our life every moment of every day. If you and I want to live lives of significance, if we want to live lives that will impact this world, then we need to understand our commitment to Jesus Christ. When you and I get saved, we surrender our lives to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And the Bible tells us that our lives are dead and they're hidden with Christ in God. In other words, we no longer belong to ourselves. We have been bought with a price. Not silver and gold, but the precious blood of of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's purchased us, and we now belong to Him. We're part of His kingdom. We serve in His army. We serve at His bidding to go where He says go, to speak when He says speak, to be quiet when He says be quiet, but ultimately to point people to our Savior. If you and I are going to make an impact in this world in which we find ourselves, we need to understand our commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. We have been called by God to be on mission with Him. God gave us our marching orders, didn't He? We're supposed to go and do what? Make disciples, aren't we? We are to go and preach the gospel to every creature is the way Mark's gospel says it. We're to go and to proclaim Jesus is Lord to a world that doesn't want to hear that. And as days get worse... As things get more perilous, people are going to want to hear that less. You see, we've got a bunch of other gods in our society today, don't we? That's what he talks about in these perilous times. People love money. They love self. They're arrogant, abusive, all those kind of things that we saw there. Those things become the gods of this world. But you and I have been called to be on mission with Christ. He doesn't want any to perish. As the song reminds us, rescue the perishing, care for the dying, snatch them in pity from sin in the grave, weep o'er the erring ones, lift up the fallen, tell them of Jesus mighty to save. Guys, we get the greatest privilege on this planet. It's walking with the Savior and telling other people how they too can come to know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. Our commitment to Jesus Christ, we ought to lead us to remember the sacred scriptures because it's only as we follow those scriptures that we will become all that God wants us to be and that we will impact the world as God wants us to impact the world. Notice lastly, not only must we understand our context, not only must we understand our commitment to Christ, but we under, need to understand the core of our faith. The core of our faith. Folks, the core of our faith is bound up in the inspired word of the living God. I like what Paul says here. All scripture is literally God breathed, breathed out by God. Paul had just noticed the scriptures had been, was, were able to make one wise in regard to salvation, a lesson that Timothy had learned long ago. If you know anything about Timothy, it was his mother and his grandmother that told him about Jesus. How many of us are here today because of our grandparents or our 
moms who, when we were little, told us about Jesus. But now, Paul wanted Timothy to understand something that he learned long ago. You know what happens when you see false teachers? You know what the, the temptation for us to do is to fight that false teaching with our anger, with our own resources, with our own thought processes. We go to God and we say, Lord, why are you letting these people even exist on this planet? They're trying to undo everything that we've done. You get angry sometimes, don't you? But what we need to do is we need to focus on the God-inspired Word. God's Word has a crucial role to, role to play in our lives and also in the ministry that God has called us to. God moved in a special way in the writers of this book. God's Holy Spirit moved in the lives of men uh, that they might write, working through their God-given personalities, working through who they were and where they were in their life. But God's Holy Spirit literally breathed out these words. They, these, these guys didn't sit around and dream up these words that we find in this book. There is no other book on this planet, guys, that's inspired like this book is inspired. This book can change a person's life. This book has words of power. Words of transformation that can transform somebody's life. Words of life, not words of death. These words are God-inspired. The word God-breathed indicates that all Scripture owes its origin and contents to the divine breath of the Spirit of God. God's Holy Spirit moving in these men's lives. The Scriptures are all that God wants them to be. God has given to us everything necessary to life and godliness. We don't need anything else. You know, there's people today in our society that would have us think that there's these lost books that didn't make it in the Bible because there were some guys that were in control of everything and they decided what was going to be in here and what wasn't going to be in here. You know what? who decided who was going to be in here? It was God. It was through the usage of the churches, the books that became most profitable to the people of God because it spoke of the Spirit of God and the Word of God. People have tried to destroy this book. You know why we still have this book today? Because of the power of the Holy Spirit that's guarded these Scriptures so that they will say to us, the most well-attested book on this planet, this book right here, Think about that for just a minute. This word is God breathed. This God inspired book is a practical instrument or tool. Paul reminds Timothy to use it and to use it correctly. He tells him to study, to show himself approved. God's word is profitable, as he says here. He tells him four things. Not, this is not an exclusive list, okay? But he tells him four reasons. Now, what's going on? He's talking about perilous times. He's talking about false prophets that have gone into women's homes. And back then, these guys would come in and, and, and pawn themselves off as being teachers. There wasn't a lot of public school systems. And what these guys would do is they would come in and agree to teach these children. And there were the women quarter and the children's quarter quarters. And these men would insinuate themselves into... The lives of these women, weak-willed women is what Paul says here. They really didn't know the truth. And because of that, they didn't know it well, and so they were easily swayed to untruth. Guys, that still happens today. You think about some of the preachers that are on television today. Have you watched and listened to what some of those guys say? Is this square with what this book says? No, it doesn't. A bunch of them preach God's Word. But there's some others up there that don't. And we need to be discerning. The Word of God, according to what Paul says here, is first of all, it's profitable for teaching. That means instructing others in what God desires. Instructing others in the truth that's found in God's Word. It's also profitable for reproof. That means it gives warnings. When you and I wander off track, when there are errors in doctrine, when there are errors in conduct, this word refutes that. This word warns us that if we continue down those paths, there's going to be nothing but misery. 
when we turn ourselves away from the, the Word of the living God. I was reading today an article uh, published by the Gospel Coalition. It was talking about, it was Tim, Timothy Keller, he was trying to, and his wife, who were writing about trying to tell young people not to be unequally yoked together before they get married. And young people, unfortunately, don't listen and don't abide by the Word of God. They decided they know better than God's Word. And they'll say something to the preacher like, well, this is my soulmate. I know I'm supposed to be with this person. Let me just say this. The Bible says, do not be unequally yoked together. What place has light with darkness? And the answer is none. We are not supposed to marry an unbeliever. You're not supposed to marry an unbeliever thinking that you can fix him or her. Let me just say this. For those of you who might not be married, you know, ask some of these people who are how much fixing goes on, gets, goes on in marriage. Ladies, have you got your guys fixed yet? No. Guys, have you got your wives fixed yet? No. It just doesn't happen, Okay. Is God's Word truth, is it not? Is it truth or it's, is it not? It's truth, is it not? God doesn't lie. There are reasons why God says what He says here. And we, every time, without fail, that you and I go against what's written in this book, we pay the consequences. Because God disciplines His children that He loves. This book is used for reproof these false teachers needed to be exposed. And Timothy, Paul has told Timothy already in 1 Timothy 5.20, As for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all, so that they may, the, the rest may stand in fear. The Word of God brings rebuking where rebuking is necessary. That's what the word reproof means. It also is profitable for correction. Re reproof stresses the negative side while... Correction emphasizes the positive side. You want it good to know that God didn't leave us to try to figure that out on our own, that He told us what the right path was? God's Word brings correction. It helps us to know this is the way that you're supposed to go. This is the things that you're supposed to do. This is the way you're supposed to live your life. God's Word tells us that. And so God's Word is profitable for uh, correction. Uh, it's also profitable for training in righteousness. Godly pastors and teachers must train God's people. Timothy needed to train those in his church. Christians need to discipline their own lives so that they can be holy unto God. They need to live in such a way that God's holiness is a normal act of life. So oftentimes we don't think we're holy, don't we? We don't often do the right thing, but are we striving to be holy? That's the key. Are we seeking to live out the radical claims of Jesus Christ in a daily basis? Paul wrote to Titus and said, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age whatever age it happens to be, this present age, where you find yourself. Waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing in the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave Himself to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for Himself a people for His own possession who are zealous for good works. Are you zealous for good works? Is the, the makeup of your being... To live a life that's holy and pleasing unto God no matter what anybody else does. No matter what anybody else says. No matter how much persecution comes. No matter how perilous the days. Are you focused on living a godly life? God's Word. God-inspired Word. The core of our faith. Paul tells us the last part of this. Why is the Scripture breathed out? Why is it profitable that the man of God and the woman of God may be competent, equipped for every good work? 
Guys, we're to live the kind of life in God's holy word, the core of our faith, the core of what we believe, helps us to live a life that's pleasing unto God and points people to our Savior. If we're going to live and even thrive during these last days, during these perilous times, we've got to understand the context in which we live. We can, there's no sense of sticking our head in the sand and acting like people aren't evil. I get so tickled, or maybe tickled, maybe aggravated is more word about these newscasters. Every time somebody walks in and shoots a bunch of people, they blame it on the guns. And I'm thinking, what about those people that get machetes and the people that get guns and the people that get, you know, take a rolling pin and hit their husband over the head or a frying pan? Or, I mean, there's all kinds. I mean, it's not the weapon. The problem is man's hearts are evil. That's the problem. We live in perilous times. The only thing that can fix that is this book right here. And you and I have, first of all, the responsibility to live according to what we find here. And second of all, to teach this word both in the way we live and the way we talk to people around us. Guys, while we live in a time of great crisis, perilous times, we also live in a time of great opportunity. Think about that for just a minute. It's easy to get discouraged in it when we see the evil times that we live in and how a lot of people don't want to have anything to do with God. Let me just say it's time of great opportunity. Because the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ still changes people's lives today. Jesus Christ is in the transforming business. When this word is proclaimed and the good news of Jesus Christ is proclaimed and the convicting power of the Holy Spirit comes in a person's heart, guess what? People get saved. Not only that, but the Bible says the gates of hell will not prevail against the church of the living God. As we go on mission with God, we literally are snatching people out of hell and bringing them into God's kingdom. Satan's not going to win the ultimate battle. He may win a battle or two, but he's not going to win the war. You and I know who that's going to, who's, who's going to do that. Guys, our God is more powerful than the evil one. He's more powerful than anything this world can come up with. And we're called, we've been bought with a price, and we're called to glorify God in our body and in our spirits, which are God's. We've been called to be on mission with Him. To help these people that are lost and dying, whose minds have been blinded by Satan himself, we need to help them to see the light of the glorious gospel found in this book right here. So that they too can come to know the Jesus that you and I know. Guys, we live in serious times, but we also live in times of great consequence, time of great opportunity. Let us spend our lives for that purpose that's noble and important. Help us to, we need to spend our time serving the living God, being on mission with Him to tell a lost and dying world about Jesus Christ. How do you live in perilous times? You live in faith and you live by faith and you live by trust in the one who saved us and you live according to this book right here. That's the way you live in perilous times. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you, Father, for your word. We thank you for what it speaks to us. Lord, I know at times it's easy to get discouraged. It's easy to see the evilness uh, that we find in the world in which we live. Lord, we know as your word is proclaimed, the closer it gets to Christ coming back, the more perilous time will become. But Father, you call us to faith, and you call us to be faithful. You call us to make a difference in the world in which we find ourselves. Lord, you call us to be on mission with you to tell a lost and dying world and to show a lost and dying world about what it means to be a Christian and how they too can come to know the one who can transform their lives. Lord, don't let us stick our heads in the sand. Don't let us be fearful. Lord, give us great courage and great boldness to be on mission with you. And Lord, I pray that and I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys have a good evening.